uh, May 1st, 2020, and this is the first time I use this car to pick up wine grapes. Um, these are the grapes from South Africa, and they just came in today. Who knows how long they took to get here, but they're in. So I was able to put 24 cases in there, and unlike uh, the grapes that come from California, there are 18 pounds to each one of these little boxes. So with 48 of these cases, I'll be able to make four Demijohns. Demijohn has about 14 gallons. These grapes need to be crushed. They're beginning to bleed, which is not unusual. After all, they come from South Africa, who knows how long. They've been either on a ship or a truck or a plane or I don't know what. Maybe the grapes are in a plastic um, wrapping, which is nice, keeps it neat. And on top of the grapes is a sheet of paper like this, in uh, many languages. And the instructions say that sulfur dioxide generator used for the preservation of table grapes. Well, these aren't freaking table grapes. They're wine grapes. So I have no idea why they do that. But I do know that there must be some sulfur um, on that piece of paper to somehow preserve those grapes. It's about 10.30 in the morning and that's when our taste buds are at their peak. So it's time for a gocetto. And gocetto in Italian means a little drop. When I used to work full time, I'd always have a bottle in my office. And when I noticed colleagues or myself a little edgy, we'd go down to my office and have a gocetto. And it takes the edge off and it gives you a nice feeling of invincibility. In wine, grape growing areas of the world, somebody measures these grapes for three things. Total acidity, sugar, and pH. When the measurements are perfect, they pick the grapes and they crush them right away. So just a word on refrigeration. You know, I have no idea when these grapes were picked. I have no clue how long they were refrigerated, but this is what refrigeration does to wine grapes. It increases pH and lowers total acidity. Uh, so that's why they need to be crushed and fermented as soon as possible, when I, uh, well, at least for me, when I bring them home. Uh, this is a kit to measure total acidity. Uh, they're cheap. Just follow the instructions. Um, this is a pH meter. Um, if you're making wine for the first time, I would definitely buy one and use it. And this is a hydrometer and a tube to measure potential alcohol, bricks, all that stuff. So I've taken um, a little bit from each fermentation barrel and in these little plates, I have uh, some yeast. It needs to sit in lukewarm water for about 15 minutes and I'm using Lavin EC118 because it works well in a high alcohol content. So I don't like to add anything unless I have to. I've measured these things and um, the Cape Blend came in at uh, the total acidity is 0.65, the potential alcohol is 13, and the pH is about 4. So I'm going to leave this alone. When the pH is above 0.6, let the pH, well, I'm sorry, when the total acidity is above 0.6, let the pH fight for itself. The uh, Pinot, Pinotage came in at a um, total acidity of 0.8 and uh, potential alcohol at 13 and the pH about 4 also. So I'm not going to touch any of these. The Shiraz, the Shiraz came in at a, a total acidity of 0.7, pH about 4 and alcohol about 12.5. That's really good. So this yeast needs to sit 15 minutes then I'll add it to this little bit of uh, juice that I took off in the fermentation barrels and I'll add it tomorrow morning. Now the yeast has done its job. I put it in last night and this morning you can see how it's uh, nicely fermented. So I'll show you each one of them. And now I'm going to pitch this into the uh, wine barrel um, and I'll show you, wine barrels are covered with towels. Uh, the temperature in the room is at about oh, 66. Um, I'll try to get it to 68 today if I can. I 
move a lot of the grapes and stems to the back of the barrel so that a lot of juice would be in the front and you can see how uh, it's starting to ferment here as well those bubbles around the edge are a sign of fermentation so now I'll pitch that yeast and the grape juice that's fermenting in here I'll let it sit overnight so this part of the barrel will be nicely fermented and then tomorrow I'll mix it all up together I'll remove some of the stems later um, so wine grapes have a natural yeast and more and more winemakers around the world are relying on that yeast to ferment the grapes now here I added a little bit of yeast because the sugar content is a little high and also the grapes came from South Africa and as I showed you earlier they're packaged and there's a piece of paper on the top of the grapes that has a little bit of sulfite so I'm afraid maybe that paper killed some of the wild yeast so that's why I'm adding a little bit but I don't like to add a lot to my wines um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can be added um, every year there are new products uh, I like the grape to talk to me if I want to drink a wine with a lot of stuff that's added I'll go buy it and I do buy a lot of bought wines uh, but I prefer the homemade wine to be as natural as possible and it's not really me making the wine here it's the grape you know there's a saying you can make bad wine from good grapes but you can't make good wine from bad grapes it's a little bit like uh, I guess uh, Michelangelo's philosophy you know he he never thought he was sculpting a statue he just thought he was setting the statue free and the statue was already in the uh, block of granite uh, the grape juice skins pulp stems seeds um, have turned to must the fermentation has started that yeast that I added yesterday has done its job nice cap is formed right there um, same thing in this barrel well, the temperature is up to 60 oh, 66 almost 68 uh, so pretty soon I can turn off this uh, little space heater keep the temperature steady um, same thing in this barrel nice fermentation has started at the side of it I'll mix this all up really well right now and then cover up and um, let those yeast cells spread out into the whole fermentation barrel the yeasts are doing their job they're changing the sugar to alcohol carbon dioxide is being released the carbon dioxide pushes the skins and the stems up to the top so we can't see any liquid or if there is any liquid is very little so we have to be careful at this point um, as the yeast convert the sugar to alcohol they can rob the room of oxygen so the old timers used to keep a, a candle lit and if the candle went out then they knew they had to open a window to let some air in uh, we're pretty safe here it's a big room uh, I open the door once in a while but I can turn I can turn the space heater off I don't need that anymore this is going really well and uh, tomorrow or the day after um, after the yeast start working and reproducing really well they need air for that but then once they're really kicking in you can cover this and I'll, I have a seal for these fermentation barrels and I'll put that um, seal on tomorrow and that allows no air in but gas to come out Go slow. keep it keep it no hold on wait a minute so old timers used to keep a candle down in their basements they wanted to make sure that they uh, as the yeast converted the sugar to alcohol all the oxygen in the room wasn't stolen so this old timer right here is going to show you how it works and he's going to lower the candle into the barrel and you'll see that boom it went out so old timers knew what they were doing it's uh, good to have a spigot at the bottom of your fermentation barrel so you can run some of the must off it and then pour it over the top so that it picks up more color uh, I measure the alcohol every day I just put some must in a tube like that and with the hydrometer um, see what the reading is kind of strange with these I haven't worked with these grapes before this Pinotage uh, has already is down to 3% alcohol so I'm gonna press this one right now but the Cape Blend is still at 8% 
and the Shiraz is also at 8%. But the yeasts are working really well. So what I like about these fermentation barrels, they come with this lid and I put the lid on now. The yeast don't need any more air to work and actually once they've multiplied and started fermenting, um, they work better in the absence of the air. Um, and it's like a bicycle tire. It's a cover with a yeah bicycle tire around it. You just pump it up with this uh, inflator there and seal it in. Now you can't, you can only put so many grapes in a fermentation barrel. See how this has risen almost to the top. Yeah, if I had put, let's say, one more box of grapes in here, that would uh, rise above the top and then I'd have a flood, like I mentioned in one of my other videos. Uh, there are many ways to break the cap. Um, break the cap, punch down the cap. I prefer the word break the cap because I just don't want to punch it down, but I want to break it up into small pieces so all the skins and the stems and the pulp mix in with the must. So that's not really meant to punch it down, but you can use something like that. Or here's an old-fashioned one, just a limb from a tree with a fork at the end. I prefer to use my hands. I just wash really well, and I like to get all the way down to the bottom. Uh, you, you can lose your breath, as I mentioned also in another video. Uh, just take a deep breath, get down there. I like to really get my fingers down to the bottom, bottom, bottom of the barrel and move everything around. Well, you know, in the old days, not that I ever did it, but people used to get into these barrels and crush the grapes with their feet, so... Um, it all works. Now uh, disinfect the wine press by mixing uh, six level tablespoons of potassium metabisulfite in a gallon of water, dissolving it, pour some in a bowl, use a cloth and just wipe everything down. And you have to leave the door open when you do that because the stuff smells really strong and you don't want to breathe it too long. Uh, also, don't use a stainless steel container to let that solution sit because it will pit stainless steel. I use a small press. Um, I like to make different kinds of wines, so that works best for me. It's also much easier to clean. I've worked with a big press before and just, just what can you So, 10 cases of uh, Pinotage fit perfectly into this little press. Uh, Demi John is over here funnel on the top, sieve on top of that. I run the wine through, I catch all the seeds and whatever that can get it back into the fermentation barrel. Um, I'm gonna press this down and then put all the parmas back into the fermentation barrel and make grappa uh, in a couple of weeks. I might add some sugar and water, I'm not sure. There are many different ways to do that. Always keep a mop close by, hot water, uh, wipe your feet on it. So. There's always, you're always going to have some um, juice skins on the floor. You step in it, the sugar sticks to your feet, so just wipe it off and always mop everything down. Nice and clean. Oh, it smells great. Pressing is a slow process, so I turn this about 10 times until it gets really tight, and then I stop, and I just wait for the... Juice to come out, must to come out. Um, I'm trying to get enough to fill this demijohn, and I'm just about there. So I'll probably go down another couple of blocks, and then that should give me enough juice. I don't want to press it too much because that last juice is it's better for grappa than it is for wine. Uh, but I did use just 10 cases of uh, Pinotage for this. I gave two to my friend Dave who knows much more about wine making and wines than I do. And my mom and dad always taught me to hang out with people who are smarter than me. So I may not get a demijohn, but I can top up with something else. That's no big deal. But Dave's the one who taught me about this Cape blend. All right, that's enough. That's uh, about as much juice as we can get out of this press. Um, the demijohn now is up off the floor. I like to get it off the floor so air can circulate around it better. It's um, full. Well, there's about another maybe a gallon, a little bit less than a gallon to put in there. But it's really boiling. It's fermenting a lot. You can see how active it is. Especially, you can see it better if you put the light in back. I mean, that doesn't, I can't do that with need long rounds. Anyway, it's still fermenting. I'm not going to fill it to the top because if I do, it'll spill over and I, I don't want to that to happen. I like to use these fermentation locks because it sounds kind of nice, that gurgling 
uh, noise. And I have a little bit more in the gallon over here. Um, I'll measure the sugar in this as soon as it gets down to zero. I'll top it up. I like to press the grapes when the sugar is about four, three percent. I don't let it go much lower than that because what happens is the skin reabsorbs the color and um, then the wine doesn't come out as dark. Now that is a beautiful color, isn't it? Wow, what a birthday cake. So my, uh, when I made wine with my dad, he would make me break this down a few times. Well, he would do it with me. He would, uh, we would break it down a few times, put it back in and get more juice out. And I don't blame him. Um, the grapes are expensive, especially these from South Africa. They're, they're double the price of those from California. Um, but I'm gonna break it down into these little uh, containers that you see around the press and put it into the fermentation barrel and make grappa in a couple of weeks. While I was sleeping, the Pinotage finished fermenting. So it was at three yesterday when it was pressed and now it's a little bit, a little bit less than 0% sugar that's left in here. So I can top it up. I'll put the rest of the wine that's in this tube where I measured the potential alcohol and it'll be just about to the top. And this is gonna sit now for 10 days. And then in 10 days, I'm gonna rack it and get rid of all that organic sediment that's on the bottom. And I'll have to make a decision whether to add some potassium metabisulfite or not. If I do, it'll be one gram per five gallons of wine. And I won't move it into the wine cellar until it, all the sugar has fermented out. I topped up the Pinotage, but not all the way to the top because when you top up, the fermentation will pick up again. Um, so I'll wait just a couple of hours or maybe tonight and top that up. I'm all set to press the Cape Blend, which is a combination of Pinotage, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Shiraz. Um, I should have listened to my friend Dave. He was the one who told me about this. He said something about Pinotage that likes to ferment at a lower temperature, like 60 degrees over a longer period of time. I looked it up and in fact, it's true. So instead of fermenting these three varieties together, I should have fermented them separately. But as the Dyson said, always make new mistakes. And that's what I've done here. It won't happen next year. So I'm all set to press. All the equipment is set up and um, winemaking in my opinion, like many things in life is all about preparation. Three points. Uh, I don't know what I don't know. No problems, only challenges and then solutions and always make new mistakes. And so I, I keep learning by keeping a journal. I've been doing this since 1997. Every time I make wine, I write everything in this notebook. I just all the kinds of notes I have. Uh, I always get lucky um, and the wine always comes out pretty good. Ten days after pressing, it's time to get the wine off of its gross leaves. Rack it, leave the tube at the very top of the receiving bottle, make sure all the wine runs down the side as much as possible so it aerates. If there are any off flavors, they'll dissipate. So I'm going from a five gallon to a three gallon because we're going to lose some wine. Oh, see, we lost about oh two bottles maybe, about two bottles in every demijohn. And the gross leaves are just that; they're pretty gross. So here they are; they don't even go through a sieve. And I have to get rid of these because these grapes uh, from South Africa and also from California, but not from the backyard. They are uh, high in pH. So I don't trust a uh, malolactic fermentation. I want to get them off the gross leaves as soon as possible. I'm going to add some sulfite right now and move them into the wine cellar. This is the fermentation room. Wine cellar is a steadier temperature. Um, all the sugar has converted to alcohol. There might be a little bit left, but racking, as I said before, helps to reactivate the yeasts. And, um, and we'll get rid of all that little bit of sugar that might be left. You can put a towel around your demijohn when you rack just in case you have any spillage. 
you don't want any wine to get into the holders for the demijohns. And just keep an eye on your racking. Make sure you don't bring up any of the gross leaves. You just keep an eye on your racking tube. And as long as it's nice and clear like that, you're good. Thanks for joining me.